uh, another wonderful Classicopia concert. Uh, thank you for coming out. Thank you to Brian and everybody here at First Congregational Church uh, for being so welcoming for so many years now as we've made this our, our central home uh, church here in the Upper Valley area. And I've lost count how many concerts we've done here. Uh, and we're actually really uh, excited because this summer we're restarting our Classicopia summer music camp uh, that we used to do 20 years ago when we first started. Uh, and we're gonna be do using uh, this church uh, in all the rooms around to do that. And so uh, that's very exciting. If you know any kids who are eight to 18 uh, who uh, play an instrument and know how to read music, uh, there's some really good people come to this camp. Wonderful faculty from all over the world will be here uh, for a tough two weeks of day camp in August. You can check out all that information on classicopia.org. Um, and uh, tonight we're really excited to uh, bring back somebody who actually played with us way back when we started Classicopia. Uh, on one of the first concerts, we did a, a young artist program. And at that time, Rosie was, I think, 12 or 13 or 14, very young, uh, and was already showing uh, her signs of being such an incredible performer. Uh, and Rosie performed with us now. She lives, uh, went off to school to Yale and the San Francisco Conservatory and was in string quartets, now is a freelancer in Providence, Rhode Island. And it's always great to bring her back home here uh, and to do some great concerts. And uh, this program uh, is really kind of exciting. It's a lot of music that uh, you probably don't know. It's music I don't know. Uh, and so it's really great to discover a sort of new pieces that are not new, but are very old, but have been neglected and forgotten in large part because these were women composers uh, and just didn't have a chance to get their voices heard. Now every time I do a concert with women composers, I have to go and read some quotes by men that make me cringe. Um, so I will start with the great Aristotle uh, back there in Greek times who said, a woman is an unfinished man who like children and barbarians are not competent in the ways of thinking. Ugh. Here's a good one from Thomas Decker in a book called The Honest Whore from 1604. He said, there's no music when a woman is in the concert. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a great enlightened philosopher, supposedly, said the following in 1775. Women in general do not like any art, know nothing about any, and have no genius whatsoever. They can acquire science, erudition, talents, and everything acquired by hard work. But that celestial flame which warms and sets fire to the soul, that genius which consumes and devours, that burning eloquence, those sublime transports which carry their raptures to the depths of hearts, will always lack in the writings of women. Their works are all cold and pretty as they are. They may contain as much wit as you please, but never a soul. They are a hundred times more sensible than passionate, which is kind of crazy, because it's usually the opposite argument made about women, that they're too over the top emotional, but we'll get that one soon. Uh, here is the great Arthur Schopenhauer, another uh, enlightened philosopher in 1850. Neither for music, nor poetry, nor the plastic arts do women possess any real feeling or receptivity. Women taken as a whole remain thorough and incurable Philistines. Hans von Bülow, famous conductor, uh, whose uh, wife was taken away by uh, Richard Wagner, uh, he said the following, reproductive genius can be admitted to the pretty sex, but productive genius unconditionally cannot. There will never be a woman composer, at best a misprinting copyist. I do not believe in the feminine form of the word creator. Ugh. Yeah, good, good for his wife. Uh, George Upton in a book called Women in Music, which you might think would be a good book. Well, keep that on. Um, uh, said the following, not only, oh, this is the other argument, not only are women too emotional and lacking in stamina to write music, but a woman's mind simply cannot grasp the scientific logic of music making. It does not seem that woman will ever originate music in its fullest and grandest forms. She will always be the recipient and the interpreter, but there is little hope she will be the creator. Uh, so with all of this, and this is not just some, some sideline arguments, this is the mainstream argument uh, that has uh, been through with us and still continues in many, in many ways. Uh, now, women have recognized this as well, and one famous pianist named Amy Fay, who actually studied with Franz Liszt, uh, said the following, women have been too much taken up with helping and encouraging men 
to place a proper value on their own talent, which they are too prone to underestimate and to think not worth making the most of. Ruskin was quite right when he so patronizingly said that women's chief function is to praise. She has praised and praised and praised and kept herself in abeyance. Women are now beginning to realize that they too have brains, even musical ones. It has required 50,000 years to produce a male Beethoven. Surely one century ought to be allowed to create a female one. Um, uh, that the saddest thing for many of these composers is that they just weren't, didn't know if they were any good because nobody was playing their music. And uh, Fanny Mendelssohn, uh, one of the great uh, composers whose brother was a uh, famous composer who could have been supportive of her, uh, was not. Uh, she kept saying, can I publish music? Should I do that? And he said, no, you're a good mother and a, and a wife, but you don't need to comp write, compose music. And she said once, uh, when one never encounters either objective criticism or goodwill, one eventually loses the critical sense needed to judge one's own work, while at the same time losing the wish to create it. Felix, who could easily take the place of an audience for me, can only reassure me sparingly. I am thus more or less alone with my music. Um, so it's really kind of uh, disheartening to hear this and of course, many women uh, sort of internalized that patriarchal system, Clara Schumann being one of the most uh, famous, who had a great quote, basically we'll hear later, that she thought she, she was gonna be a great composer at some point, but it was too arrogant for her to do that since there had never been a great woman composer. Uh, so, and so many of the times these, these women wrote music and then it wasn't published. And of course, once it's not published, it's hard to get that music out. A lot of this music that we're playing now was not published up until about 10, 15 years ago has been sort of a, a rediscovered. And so it's our mission to make sure that this music gets out and gets heard. We're gonna begin with uh, a French uh, composer, Pauline Viardot, uh, who lived a very long life, born in 1821, dies in 1910. I think she lived 89 years that way. Um, she actually came from a very musical family. Uh, her parents were both from Spain, and they were both opera singers. Uh, and so as a young girl, she would travel around Europe. I went to Spain and to France and to England and to Germany uh, listening to this opera. And apparently she was fluent in five languages by the time she was six years old. Um, she had an older sister, Marie Mar Malibran, who became a very famous a diva. Uh, and was sort of the, the celebrated singer in Paris until she had a horse accident and died at the age of 28. Uh, and so after she dies, uh, young Pauline, who really wanted to be a pianist, she actually studied uh, piano with Franz Liszt, uh, her parents said, you need to take over for Marie now and go out and be a singer. Uh, and so she ends up becoming this great diva, uh, like her sister, and singing all across Europe uh, and uh, sort of getting, a, getting to fame that way. Uh, but she was good friends with Frederick Chopin and George Sand, and she would go and hang out in Noal, where they had their home in the uh, middle of uh, France, uh, and uh, sort of uh, spend time with them. And in fact, uh, she was the only one that Chopin allowed to turn his music into songs. She actually arranged several mazurkas that Chopin wrote and put words to it, uh, and he uh, agreed with that and actually helped her write some of these. Uh, so she had kind of a fascinating life. She also spent time in uh, St. Petersburg uh, singing, and while she was there, uh, she met uh, Tergenev, uh, the great Russian writer, who fell madly in love with her. Now, by this time, she was already married to uh, Viardo, who was 20 years older than her and ran the Comédie Italienne, and they had a lovely marriage. But somehow, Tergenev then came back to Paris and lived in their house for 20 years. Uh, I don't know how that worked out with the husband. Um, but. Uh, she just seemed to uh, just inspire these men around her, and there were many people writing music for her. Uh, Sassons wrote Samson and Delilah for her to sing. Uh, Brahms wrote his alto rhapsody for her. Schumann, Gounod, Meyerbeer, Foire, all composed music for her. And George Sand wrote a, a novel, Consuelo, based upon her life. So uh, she was kind of a center of Parisian life and had a salon at her house uh, for many years uh, that all of these people came to. Uh, she had a brother-in-law, Charles de Blériot, who was a famous violinist and a composer. Her own son also became a violinist. So she wrote quite a lot of music for violin. And we're gonna actually play one of the pieces she wrote in 1874, a sonatina in A minor. It's in three kind of short little movements. The first movement is uh, very slow and has a bit of Bach quality to it. Uh, it's sort of uh, regal and old in many ways. And then the second and third movement 
have a much more Spanish flair uh, and some really lovely melodies. So we hope you enjoy Pauline Biardo. Please put your hands together and welcome our featured guest, Miss Rosie Watson. <laughs> Thank you. 
next is Pauline Vierdo. Uh, she wrote over 100 songs, too. Really a fun uh, Spanish flavor to her writing. Now, the next composer I had never heard of until about three weeks ago. Uh, so it's really exciting to be able to discover her music. And in fact, I also discovered at the same time a, a piano quartet that I'm playing next week of hers down in Baltimore. So it's a mega Runkin Meyer week uh, with me. Uh, and it's really uh, fantastic uh, to find uh, these new people. She was a Swedish composer. In fact, the first female graduate to go to the Royal College of Music in Stockholm uh, when she graduated there in 1872. Uh, she was born in 1853, sadly only lived to 40 years old. Uh, she ended up having tuberculosis after the death, uh, after the birth of her se uh, second child. Um, she actually uh, came from a, 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 a middle-class family. Her father was actually a baker, but he loved music, and uh, he began to teach her early on on violin. She also played uh, cello and piano uh, and organ. Um, but uh, she ultimately got so good at the, at, in Sweden that she went to Leipzig, which was kind of the, the center of musical education in the middle of the 19th century. And she studied there with the concertmaster of the Gavans House Orchestra, a guy named Engelbert Ronken, uh, who happened to have a son named Julius Ronken, who fell madly in love with Amanda Meyer. Uh, and they ended up getting married uh, and then moving to Amsterdam. And uh, at that time, when you got married, that usually meant the end of your career if you were a woman. Uh, and she didn't write that much at, after she got married. The piano quartet that she wrote was the, at the very end of her life. She sort of came back to it. Uh, but most of what she did was written in these 1870s uh, when she was there in Leipzig and was just filled with this uh, hope and imagination uh, to play. Uh, she got to be very good friends with lots of big wigs in the music. Uh, the Griegs used to hang out at her place. Uh, Anton Rubinstein, Josef Joachim, Clara Schumann, Johannes Brahms, all would come and, and go to the salons that would happen uh, in her place, uh, passing through Sweden or from when they lived in Amsterdam. Uh, so she was kind of another center like Viardo was. Um, but uh, we really don't know that much about her. Uh, we know this uh, sonata was uh, probably uh, written in 1874-75, right around the same time that Viardo was writing hers, uh, but may have been unplayed for uh, about 100 years uh, after that. Uh, and it was only sort of rediscovered in some papers, uh, and it was in manuscript form. It was only put out in a printed form, uh, I think about 15 years ago, and uh, uh, recently has just been uh, uh, played and recorded by a few people. Uh, but I think it's a really excellent piece, uh, filled with romantic passion that's in uh, three movements. Uh, we get this sort of tumultuous uh, first movement uh, rising out of the, the bottles of the piano. Uh, there's a beautiful lyrical second movement. In the middle of that, there's a little fugue that goes on. Uh, if you remember that idea that women can't do in anything intellectual. Well, a lot of these women wanted to write fugues to show they could do the most in, in, in intellectual thing possible. And I think that section is her showing off her uh, uh, intellectual side. Very difficult little fugue she writes. Uh, and then the last movement is uh, a lot of fun, and to me, rem reminiscent of uh, kind of the Brahms Hungarian dances. It has these great ac syncopated accents uh, that make you want to just get up and dance. So you're free to do that if you want. Uh, here's uh, Amenka Ronkin Myers for uh, Sonata. After this, we'll take just about a 10 minute break. Uh, there are uh, two bathrooms back here, one there, and one past that. Uh, and we'll come back for some more. Amanda Ronkin Myers, please welcome back. Rosie Watson.